So uh, my name is Martin Vianu. I'm coming from uh, the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Switzerland, uh, most known uh, of Deutsch in ETH. Um, I will present you a new method, new fuzzing method, in order to uncover buffer overflows. Uh, normally, I will give all the background to understand things. So uh, the idea is to be uh, just cool, so don't, uh, don't be afraid of the technique. Yeah. So the, the idea, as you have seen probably yesterday, uh, another guy, Martin Jones, I think, presented new techniques and give a sort of state of the art of the technique uh, used in order to find buffer overflows. But in this case, we never have source code. The idea, uh, in fact, is to test uh, softwares uh, under, for example, Microsoft Windows, but uh, under GNU2. So first, I'm sorry, I will just have to say you what is a buffer overflow. Probably you have uh, listened uh, this kind of uh, information for 1,000 times. Then I will give uh, the state of the art of techniques used to uncover buffer overflows. We will see exactly what is fuzzing. Then I will present you the technique called fuzzing by weighting attacks with markers. I will present you Autodafé, an implementation of this technique. And finally, just uh, two demonstrations. First, a small introduction. I wanted to speak a little bit about Alan Turing. Uh, Alan Turing is one of the fathers of the computers. Uh, he worked at Bleichley Park, and uh, his story is quite inter interesting because when he was there, he was with mathematicians, and he was not very well, because he said, I'm not very smart, I can't find something very uh, incredible in cryptography, in cryptanalysis. And the director of the Blood Shop Black say, okay, you have your own ideas of, the, uh, of how to cryptanalyze uh, crypto systems, so try to do on your own way. And that's why he invented the first computer called the bomb to do a simple exhaustive search. But in fact, Alan Turing was, for me, the first references of consequences of a functional error. In a paper, Computing Machinery and Intelligence, published in 1950, he tried to answer to the question, can machines think? And he reduced this problem to a game, the imitation game. So it's a very simple game. Now it's, it's famous due to CAPTCHA. For example, when you create an account on Hotmail, you have a small number, just twill, strange. You have to rewrite it. It's just to make the difference between a human and a script, a computer. It's quite the same game. First, you have a human, an interrogator. Then you have two entities, and for five minutes, the interrogators ask questions to A and B. There is one human and one computer. The goal is, after five minutes, to know who is the computer. If the computers can, be, can answer like a human, you can, say, can, you can say machines can think. To do that, the goal of the computer is to influence the decision of the interrogator. It can use human psychology. For example, you give a computation to do, an addition. The computer can just simulate a reflection, a few seconds, and give, why not, a wrong answer. The question is, is it possible for the interrogator to use something to change to change the behavior, to influence the decision of a computer. Turing said say yes with functional errors. For example, if we have a small processor, 8-bit processor, just recognize bytes, you can ask to add 1 to 2056, and it can answer null, so you can have sort of proof that you are speaking to a computer. 
but is there another solution to modify the decision of a computer? If we look uh, with uh, the case of a human, you can use senses, hearing, sight, touch, smell, taste, and with them, you can try to convince the human to, tr to threat him, to fear, or to torture him, always in order to influence his decisions. With computer, you have inputs, like inputs fields, protocols, files, RPCs, library core, or other stuff. But in fact, you cannot really convince threat, fear, or torture a computer. There are finite state machines. So there is a solution, and now the most used is buffer overflows. So what is a buffer overflow? Very small example, few details. There is a, a simple call, the famous string copy function. This software just ask for an argument, copy it on a buffer of 16 bytes, print it, and exit. A small example, you give a string, and it just print it like this. Why functions are used? In fact, when, you are, when a software is trying to do something 1,000 times, especially before, the memory was a big problem. So the solution is to copy the same instruction for 1,000 times in the memory. But the idea is to use a function. A function is only on one part of the memory. And when you need to, do, to use this function, you just simply jump on an address. And then you execute the same routine. But what to do when the function is terminated? You need to know how to come back to, in this case, the main function. To do that, you use a memory, a part of the memory called stack. And there, you save the return address before jumping on the function. You save another value, not very important. And then you define, in this example, 16, a buffer of 16 bytes. And you see there how the buffer is filled. You start here, and in our example, you just feel like this. So the idea is, if, if we enter data, much more data than the size of the buffer, you will simply overwrite first the save frame pointer and finally the return address. And then when the function will exit, you can say to the, to the process to jump in another part of the memory. In this case, it's possible because the function string copy it doesn't check if the destination buffer, in this case, the buffer buffer, is big enough to contain the data of the argument. Uh, here is a proof using GDB, where you launch the same software, the program. You see that at the first case, uh, it's okay. And then you see this bytes are overwrite the return address because we receive a signal. In this case, a segmentation fall because in this address, you cannot execute an instruction. Uh, in practice, when you want to take control of a process, the idea is just to jump in a part of the memory you control and where the way, uh, there is what we call a shell code. For example, give you a backdoor or something else. There is different types of buffer overflows. We have seen here the basics, the school case of stack overflow. You have heap overflow, formal string, integer overflow, and other types. So now, basically, how to the, the goal is to find buffer overflows in softwares. So how to do it? Let's see how our program is created chronologically. First, we have a source code. It's compiled, and you obtain a binary file. It executes, and you have the bi this binary mapped on the memory. On each step, you can try to find buffer overflows. The first one is simply to analyze the source code. And then you can try to discover, pot discover potential flaws. 
A basic example presented yesterday is rats. And in our example, we have the results. First, the definition of our local buffer. And then, the most important, the, the, the use of string copy. The advantages of this technique is very fast. You don't need really skills. You can do this job automatically. And it checks completely the, the software because you have all the source code. But the drawbacks are you need the source code, and it's not always the case. It detects only what we can call basic vulnerabilities. You have a lot of false positives. For example, on SendMail, you have 4,000 uh, reports about just a stack-based buffer. And it's based on the name of the function. Uh, I remember um, it was Samba who was backdoored by, the source was backdoored for two days, and uh, he just had a define to change the functions like strncpy, the secure version of string copy, by string copy. Then, if you have just a binary file, you can try to do a static binary analysis. It's quite hard. In this example, it's the same function uh, using a tool uh, called IDA. The other pros is uh, it's the most in-depth method. You don't need the source code, but you need to, to know very well assembly. You can detect quite complex vulnerabilities because you have another abstraction, which is the machine language. The drawbacks is you need the binary software. And most important, you need very good human skills. And of course, it takes a lot of, lot of times. The third method is to use dynamic binary analysis. In this case, the first things you need is just to simulate an interaction. You need to have something who can use the software. It's what we call a fault injection tool or a fuzzing tool. And then you need a trusser or debugger in order to analyze the reaction of the target software. You have quite some examples. Uh, Protos, fuzz, probably the most known spike and pitch. And for the debugger, it's quite uh, always the same GDB. You have Valgrind too, which can be used, or L traces, S trace. The, the fault injection is not really new. Uh, you can find this technique in order to test hardware, for example, even cars. Uh, the idea is just to do some basic changes, like a bit clip, and to, to analyze the reaction of the software. The goal is not security related, it's to detect bugs in general. And most of the case, the bug is detected because the software crash or you have the memory, a full memory state or. So what is the fuzzing? The fuzzing is, at least for me, a subset of fault injection because it was designed, it was invented to uncover uh, security-related bugs. Uh, fuzzing come from the word, the name of the first fuzzer called Fuzz, who was just a software uh, which creates random strings and send them to, to, uh, to other programs. Let's see what the advantages and the drawbacks in practice. Okay, a small example. It's a very basic protocol. You have first a fixed string, quest, then you have a length, which corresponds to the length of the variable string. This length is on 32 bits, big and yum. And finally, you have a fixed string n. If you want to try to fuzz a server, for example, which use this protocol, you use a fuzzer, and you have the server on a target. If you send random characters, or just a's, in this case, most of the time you have check functions. In this case, the function will, for example, check if the first four bytes are equals to quest. Otherwise, the packet is rejected. So it's quite useless to do that. You are wasting your time. 
If you know that it starts with quest and end with the string end, another check function check if the length of the string is equal to the length value. Otherwise, the package is rejected. Trying to test this strings is completely useless. If you know exactly how is the protocol, you have chances to reach vulnerable functions. This case is inspired by a remote administration software and the flow still exists. Uh, I, I like to, to, co to, to speak with cryptographic problems. So in this case, if you have only 15 bytes, trying all the solutions is like trying an exhaustive search on a key of 120 bytes. If you know how the protocol works, it's only four billion solutions to try, only. So the, the advantages of this technique is you don't need the source code. Sometimes you even don't need the binary. Every uncovered buffer overflows are real. You don't really need skills to do that. You can let the computer doing the work at night the drawbacks are a lot of tests are useless. And as the binary file analyzes, it takes a lot, a lot of times. And of course, it's not a total solution to discover every buffer overflows. So a proposition to increase the efficiency of this technique is to reduce the test space. To do that, we have seen through the example that if you understand the protocol is much more better. If you especially can parse length, it's better again. And finally, every strings, substituted strings are not relevant. First, understand protocol. In this case, if you know that the protocol is written like this, you can reduce significantly the test space. If you can parse length, it's very important in this case the length value should correspond to the length of the string value. And finally, some strings, testing some strings are useless. For example, if you test these strings and again these strings, there is chances that it will not give, it will give the same answer. So if you can reduce the size of the fuzzing library, it's much more better. But these techniques represent the state of the art of fuzzing. The problem is in practice, the size of the test space is still near infinite. So the idea is to reduce it again. This solution called fuzzing by waiting attacks has the same objective. So what is the size of the test space? First, we have what we call a fuzzing string library. It's in fact uh, a space which contains all the substituted strings you will test. For example, uh, A, a lot of A's, a lot of B, etc. Then you multiply the cardinality of this space with the number of strings you want to fuzz. In our example, it's quite simple because you have, we have only one string to fuzz, but in most of the cases, you have a multiple choice of strings. Then you can add another space which corresponds to the number. Fuzzing number is quite important too. So this question represents the size of the test space. If we want to reduce this size, we know that we cannot really try to reduce the fuzzing string library because it, normally every field in this library has been chosen because one time a buffer overflow has been discovered by this kind of things. Remember format strings, trying uh, these kind of things. The same thing for the fuzzing number library, but this one and this one can be reduced. And it's a multiplication here, L times S. So it's much, much better to reduce these two subspace. How to do that, for example, by using weights, weighting the attacks. We have a fuzzer and a target. This target is monitored by a trusted debugger. 
In this case, imagine you send an original packet dumped by, uh, with a sniffer or whatever. If this tracer is able to say, no, don't trust this packet, it's useless to try this one, at least at the, at the beginning. You send another packet, and then the tra tracer say, okay, I found something interesting, like a format string, try to fuzz it. Then the fuzzer will try every entries of the fuzzing library and eventually find something. That's what I said, we reduce this to spaces. Okay, it's fine in theory, but how to know if it's relevant to fuzz or not to fuzz a string or a value? Using markers can be a solution. So the question is, what is a marker? In this case, a marker is a string, like this one, this one, and this one. As we have seen, this one can be relevant to first, but not this one and this one, because they are fixed string just used by the protocol. The idea is quite simple. The tracer first say, okay, the fuzzer say, okay, here is the string I want to try to fuzz. He send a normal request. Then the debugger can analyze how the target software works. And he can say, okay, what I have seen, this string is used by strcpy, so it's relevant to try this string at the beginning. Then the fuzzer know which string he has to try first, and in this case, find a buffer overflow. So there is four steps. The first one, understand noun and, why not, unknown protocols. Length parsing, fuzzing, using a fuzzing library, and finally, waiting attacks with markers. Autodafe is uh, an implementation, practical implementation of this te technique in order to prove the efficiency. Autodafe come from his act of faith. In fact, it, it was used during the Inquisition, especially in Spain. The idea was to burn somebody, and if the smoke is white, it was good, and if it was black, it was not good. But it's too late. So the idea is to torture software, so that's why the name is choose like that. Autodafe is used by four modules, ADC, PDML 2AD, Autodafe, and ADBG. The first one is to answer to the question, understand known and unknown protocols. It uses a block-based script language. In fact, it's very close to the block-based script invented by Dave Atel uh, through the further spike. Here you have a, a parser which can check your syntax. It's much more for development. It can check your syntax and be sure that your file is correctly done and there is no error. Here is an example of the description of the example. Remember, it's this string. You have quest, a number, a string, and another string. So you define first a packet, a block. This block stopped here and stopped here. First you have a string, fix a string. Then you define a value, size value. In this case, big engine 32 bits. And you give the name of the block. Then if you change this value or any value on the block, the size will be recomputed and accepted by the check functions. Then there is another string, this one. And finally, the string end. And at the end, you have just a, a carriage you turn. You, you finish the block here, and you send it. By default, it's sent by TCP. The biggest problem if you have used fuzzers like Spike is to write your own script and try to understand how protocols work. So the idea is to use the ethereal engine to recognize 530 
protocols. To do that, you just need to export a dump using the PDML function and then convert this file using this tool. This, you can just uh, dump a cell mail connection, uh, SMTP connection, for example, and after that, just uh, choose what you want to try to fuzz, which field you want to try to fuzz. The, this is an example of the automated recognition on our SSH uh, communication. The first packet, you see you have some commands, the string, and the order if it's a received packet or a sent packet. For the fuzzing library, the idea is quite simple. You have a file, and on this file, every, every, every a file describes other files, and every file you have the letter you want to substitute to every strings. The idea is to test server side and client size, side, because in practice, most of the time, every server are well used, well test, but clients not all the time. For example, CVS or Subversion are not very well protected on the client side. You can first files. Uh, now it's quite well used, but uh, the idea is to not create connections, but create a lot of files and test each file uh, recursively. The further, called Autodafe, this is this part is here, can be connected to a debugger in order to wait attacks. As I said, the, the further can uh, automatically recompute the length fields of each first packet. Here is an example of the size you can give, 32 bit, little, big and young, 16 bit, 8 bit, or even strings using characters. For example, when you send an information HD using HTTP post, you need to write the content length field with characters. ADBG is in fact a debugger. It's connected to the engine further Autodafe, and they work together. They communicate using a TCP connection. This software exists on Windows and Unix. The idea is the further send first the marker to the debugger, then the further will send an or original traffic in order to analyze the, the behavior of the target software. Finally, the debugger tracer will listen on every vulnerable function and send reports to the further and give weights which one he has to try first. To conclusion, what I wanted to say is about Alan Turing. He said that it's not possible in this paper because he considered uh, these machines as abstra mathematical abstract fictions. But in practice, this difference can be used by people to change the behavior of a computer. There is a, a small story about the Apple logo and Alan Turing. I've read on the booklet uh, of the 223 that Steve Jobs said that the logo comes because he was working in an Apple company who sell apples. Uh, another story is to say uh, this is a, a tribute to Alan Turing because even if he's, for me at least, uh, the, the creator of computers, uh, he was rejected by the English community because he was homosexual and he committed suicide uh, 50 years ago by eating an apple he laced with cyanide so you can see the homosexual flag with six colors and an apple half eaten. Uh, before the question, I will show you two examples. One with, a, it's just a, a school case. It's the same protocol we have seen. And another example, uh, a real case on files.
So the, the first one will use a TCP connection. We'll use the same protocol we have seen. There, I, there is a, it's not easy. <laughs> the first file is what is sent by the uh, Ethereal software. It's not clear, and in this case, is a sort of uh, ASCII protocol, so even if this protocol is not recognized by Ethereal, we can we can describe it using Autodafi script. So with this file, you use a converter, PDML to AD, and you obtain this file. As you have seen, it's quite simple. You have a block here and here. This block, first you have a string, fixed string, you have the the size, big and young, 32 bits of the block. We have another block. I don't know why, I don't remember why. And there you have a string we won't try to first, so you just add first before the word string. Then you have the string end and the return key rage. And finally, you have to send this packet. Then, Then first, in this case, the trusted debugger has recognized these functions and just wait for a connection from the fuzzer. The fuzzer, by using the description of the file, will try to fuzz the field hello to 2 cc to 2 c 3 Okay, first the library is loaded. You can see the markers here, and in a few seconds, the fuzzer will try recursively to send much more packets. You see the normal packet, and after that, this field is changed, and the value here, which is the size, is incremented automatically. So as you have seen here, we didn't need to try to test, for example, the field, the string, and our quest, because it was useless thanks to the debugger. And in this case, we have a segmentation fault. Unfortunately, I can't give you the real example. As I said, it's a remote administration software, but sort of simulations of the real bug. For the second one, it's a real one. Based on file. In this case, it's ghost view. Ghost view has a lot of vulnerabilities, even in the version distributed by distributions. In this case, mine is Slackware, and the uh, ghost view is always vulnerable. The first idea is to create a PS file. Here we go. Normal PS file, and then we convert it so it's done by script in an AD file. Here you have the version using Autodafi script, and you can find the field we want to try to fuzz. There, doesn't work, so. When you see first string, this string will try to fuzz. To do that, there is no connection. We are trying to fuzz a file. So the idea is we will create 4,000 different files, and a script will try to charge to load every files recursively. So you see there the creations of different files where every uh, fuzzing variable are changed according to the fuzzing library or the X value library.
So the, the version of Gus View is the last one, if I didn't make mistake, yeah. So now what we'll do is try to load every files generated and uh, monitor it by the debugger in order to have uh, a, a state of the, the failure. You can see the, the call, and finally, we have a segmentation fault, very basic stack overflow on a, on a ghost view document. I can show you. <laughs> I can show you something else. The idea is just to count how many markers are used by vulnerable functions always in the case of ghost view. So it will load ghost view, as you recognize, and finally give the number of vulnerable calls. It's 170. In fact, there is only 12 vulnerable call, but 170 markers are called, called by this vulnerable functions. I had another example, but I can't show you, unfortunately, because as you know now, publication is quite a problem, especially in Switzerland, where there is a law. You cannot give freely uh, exploits or things like that. There is a, an act. But what I can say publicly is after testing in many software, especially on, a, on the world of Windows, uh, 865 buffer overflow were found. Uh, buffer overflow uh, where you can have access, where buffer overflow you can use really. Uh, most of the case, heap or stack overflows. So now the, this tool will be released at the end of the month of January. Um, the idea is to have a, a sort of framework where you can uh, yourself try to find new flow or try to, uh, to audit your own code in practice with fuzzing. So if you have a, a question or comments. Okay, if it's not clear, I'm writing a, a big tutorial so you will find it on the SourceForge uh, at the end of the month of January, and uh, I hope you will use it. Thank you.